It is Zero Z on the 24th of January. Thanks again for tuning in to 28storms.com. Today's video will include analysis of all tropical disturbances in the southern hemisphere. Starting from east to west, beginning with tropical cyclone Gary, there have been some recent developments over the last 6 to 12 hours. The latest tracks from both the Fiji Meteorological Services and U.S. Joint Typhoon Warning Center have been shifted a bit more toward the west, toward the extended range, and this is the first graphic from Fiji. You can see that the track is now taking the storm or center of the storm very close to the Cook Islands, now just to the west of Aitutaki and Rarotonga as a weakening Category 2 down to a Category 1. The most recent JTWC update from within the last three hours indicates that maximum sustained winds are currently 40 knots, with some room for intensification up to 45 knots over the next 24 hours, but overall their intensity forecast keeps the tropical cyclone minimal and barely above cyclone status. And the Cook Islands are not overlaid on this graphic, but much like the Fiji Meteorological Service's most recent track, this is also implying a path through the southern Cook Islands. The latest Dvorak satellite estimates are also up to 3.5, which indicates that the maximum sustained winds have potentially increased to near 55 knots, which translates to 65 miles per hour, or 10 miles per hour just under what we would consider a Category 1 hurricane in the Atlantic Basin. Some of the most recent microwave satellite imagery also reveals somewhat of a developing eye-like feature within the central dense overcast, so Cyclone Gary is definitely intensifying as of late, but this intensification phase is only expected to be temporary. Today's visible satellite animation reveals that we are still dealing with very partly cloudy skies and nice weather conditions out across the southern Pacific, including the lower Cook Islands, but you will start to notice more of the southern outflow from tropical cyclone Gary starting to work its way into the area later tonight and especially by tomorrow morning. And on this visible satellite animation, you can also see that eye-like feature beginning to develop within the central dense overcast of the tropical cyclone. But as we turn to the enhanced infrared and especially the water vapor imagery, you will find that much of the western semicircle of the tropical cyclone is void of any significant convection, and this is due to moderate to strong wind shear. So the tropical cyclone is highly lopsided to the east, and it's very asymmetric, and this trend is expected to become more apparent over the next 24 to 48 hours as the westerly vertical wind shear values are set to increase. Now in terms of the steering, this tropical cyclone has been guided toward the east by a equatorial steering ridge to the north, and that has provided the westerly flow just to the south, but over the next two to three days, the tropical cyclone will start to feel more of a weakness out across the Cook Islands. We see that there is ridging coming in from the lower right-hand corner of the screen, and the flow around this ridge would promote a more southerly turn along its western flank, and we also have troughing approaching from the Coral Sea and Southwest Pacific, so this is going to set up the alleyway for a gradual turn to the southeast. Here is a look at the 18Z run of the GFS forecast model, and just to get your bearings, this is American Samoa. Just to the east of Samoa is where our tropical cyclone is located, and we have the Cook Islands in the lower right southeast corner of the screen. The wind vectors that you see plotted on this map represent the mid-level steering pattern, and as we talked about, we have westerly flow along the southern end of the equatorial ridge to the north of the tropical cyclone, and the tropical cyclone is currently embedded within this westerly flow. However, as we go into the next 24 and 48 hours, you see the storm beginning to take on more of a southeasterly turn, as we do have more in the way of troughing coming in from the Coral Sea just to the south of Fiji. You see this upper level low here, and the flow around this upper level low is promoting northwest winds, and this is also going to help the storm turn more toward the southeast. And that mid-level steering ridge that we saw on water vapor is too far to the east to be captured by these images, but the ridge is also going to help make the storm turn more toward the south in addition to the upper level low coming in from the west. So as we go beyond 63 hours, you see more of a due south motion, especially as this upper level low continues to amplify and strengthen to the south of Fiji. If we go ahead and rewind this animation just a little bit, you can see that the storm will be passing directly through the Cook Islands based on the most recent model guidance. And based on this model depiction, it looks as though the storm will be passing through Aitutaki as we go into Friday night, and then by Saturday morning, it will be making its closest approach to Rarotonga. Now, as we talked about earlier in the video, the upper-level conditions do not appear to be favorable enough to support a significant tropical cyclone, and despite the temporary intensification process that is underway, Gary is likely to be undergoing significant weakening 
as it passes through the lower Cook Islands. So we can still anticipate numerous showers and storms, especially now that the storm may pass a little closer to the islands compared to what we were looking at 12 hours ago. But still nothing more than gale force winds are expected. So if you pick up any loose items around your home and you take shelter as the storm is passing through, you should be able to make it through Gary without any significant problems. Nonetheless, we still encourage you to keep up with the latest information, especially from the Fiji Meteorological Services, the official tropical cyclone forecast agency of the South Pacific. As we work our way westward, we are still dealing with the remnants of tropical cyclone Oswald over much of eastern Queensland. You can see that the convection remains numerous and widespread as moisture from the monsoon trough, the Gulf of Carpentaria, and the Coral Sea continues to funnel into the low-level circulation and maintain the strength of the low. And we also have very interesting features to point out on the water vapor. This imagery helps define some of the mid-level steering parameters that we are dealing with. And we have been dealing with a very strong ridge out across Australia for the better half of this season. This is why the temperatures out across much of the country have been well above normal as this ridge has held tough for quite some time now. But we do have more in the way of troughing coming through the Australian Bight and this is helping to place a squeeze on the ridge. The ridge is beginning to lose its grip out across New South Wales and southeast portions of the country. So as the mid-level heights begin to fall here, that is the reason why the low is going to continue to slide down the east coast of Australia. And this more robust trough just entering the picture in the lower left is going to be one of the stronger forces that are going to control the speed and movement of the tropical low beyond days three and four. As we go into 120 hours or roughly day five, it is going to be perpendicular to the coast of Victoria into New South Wales, so right around this area. And this is going to also amplify the ridging that will soon develop to the west of New Zealand. So the two features combined together are going to create an alleyway for the tropical low to continue to slide down the coast potentially beyond Brisbane, and it's still somewhat too early to say whether or not it's going to hug the coast or move just east of Brisbane out across the Coral Sea, but either way, it looks like we're going to be dealing with heavy rainfall up and down the coast for at least another three to four and potentially even five or six days. As we turn on the latest low-level vorticity, we can clearly see that the center of circulation is just to the northwest of Townsville, and as we turn on the wind shear vectors, even if the center of circulation were to temporarily move back out over the Coral Sea, the upper level winds in terms of the wind shear is not conducive for additional tropical cyclone development. The main core of favorable upper level ridging and light winds aloft is centered over Queensland at this time, so the prospects for redevelopment into a Category 1 appear to be fairly low, but as always you will want to check up with the Bureau of Meteorology for more frequent updates on the prospects of tropical cyclone formation. But either way, let's face it, folks, I mean, what's the difference between a tropical low and a Category 1 in terms of destructive winds? It's really not all that different, but the main key here with Cyclone Oswald, as has been the case all along, will continue to be the risk of heavy rainfall and flooding. In the extended range, it is fairly likely that the low will eventually reemerge into the Coral Sea to the southeast of Brisbane, but as you start to move this far south, the water temperatures begin to plunge below the 26 degrees Celsius threshold needed for tropical cyclone development, but you can still have a very strong low down here as it starts to transition from being a purely tropical system to more of a mid-latitude system, so you can still be dealing with very heavy rainfall and gusty winds. So let's now apply all of this information when looking at the latest 12 seed run of the ECMWF forecast model, and we are going to look at each day, including the mid-level steering along with the surface depiction. So this is the 24-hour forecast. As we talked about using the water vapor imagery, the mid-level ridge out across central Australia is being squeezed from southeast to northwest as we do have more in the way of troughs coming in through the Bight of Australia. And even though the reflection is weak this high up in the atmosphere, you can barely make out the resemblance of the tropical low right along the Queensland coast. But it is much more visible at this time using the low-level 850 millibar or hectopascal level. So as we go into 48 hours now, you can see that the troughing down toward the south is continuing to do its job by weakening the ridge out across the southeast portion of the country, but it's also beginning to flatten out as the energy isn't quite as strong. But it's still enough to pull the tropical cyclone more down toward the south. And also notice the other second most important steering factor, the ridging that is taking shape out across New Zealand. This is going to prevent the tropical low from moving directly southeast and quickly away from Australia as we will see more in just a moment. But this is the 48-hour low-level depiction, and you can see that the surface low is continuing to move more toward the south, 
At this time, it is very close to Rockhampton. And as we press on into 72 hours, the ridge has repositioned itself more so over Western Australia, and the pattern is becoming more amplified out east. You see the troughing is a little bit more energized and is amplified from south to north. This is also resulting in a more amplified ridge. So this is the big block to the southeast. So both of these mid-level steering factors combined together are going to create an alleyway for the low to continue to ride down the coast. This is the low level look at 72 hours. Then as we go into day four, the ridge is now displaced well to the west and centered over the Pilbara, and we continue to see more semi-permanent troughing out across New South Wales to the west of Sydney. And as we look at the surface depiction, the low is now starting to approach Brisbane from the north. As we go into 120 hours, this is where things also start to get interesting. The ridge is still well out to the west. The trough has now fully captured whatever is left of the tropical low. The ridge is still blocking everything from moving directly offshore to the southeast. And as we look at the low levels, you can see that the low pressure itself is beginning to re-intensify. Now, there is some question as to whether or not it would still be fully tropical at this time, or if it's already beginning to acquire more in the way of mid-latitude characteristics. As we go back to the mid-level steering for just one more moment, you can see that the trough again has fully captured the system, and the trough could be in the process of converting this more so into a baroclinic non-tropical low, and storms can start to intensify as they go through this transitioning process. Either way, excluding the technicalities, it is quite obvious that the European model is re-strengthening the low at the surface, which means more in the way of strong winds and heavy rainfall, especially right along the coast. Now, viewers down there should also keep in mind that we are still looking at nothing more than a single forecast model, so there is some room for this to deviate a little more to the east or a little more to the west, and it could be also a little stronger or a little weaker, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Something else to consider is that usually when the pattern becomes more amplified, as being shown by many of the models, they usually handle the track of the lows a little better. So we are fairly confident, even five to six days out, that the low will be in that same general spot, give or take about 200 to 300 kilometers, which isn't all that much of a difference when you're talking about a five-day forecast. It's really the transition process and the intensity of the low that is more in question. And finally, as we go out into day six, the trough has fully captured the system. The ridge is now beginning to shift more toward the east and east of New Zealand. Therefore, the low is finally starting to move away from Australia, but you can still see it maintaining quite a lot of intensity despite being over sub-26 degrees Celsius water temperatures as it is now being shown as a fully mid-latitude baroclinic low moving into the mid-latitudes. In terms of surface winds and the surface depiction, this is what we can expect if the ECMWF model solution were to fully verify going into 96 and 102 hours into the future. You can see the center of circulation near or just to the east of Brisbane with winds in excess of 30 to even 40 knots. And we're talking about one minute sustained winds just offshore. So immediate coastal communities are definitely going to be impacted by heavy rainfall and strong winds if this run were to verify. And what's even more intriguing, as we saw with the prior graphics, the storm is only going to re-intensify even more as we go into 120 to 123 hours near day 5 as it continues to parallel much of the coastline if we are to believe this solution. And you're still looking at winds in excess of 40 to 50 knots even as the center of circulation passes just to the east of Sydney. Now, with all of this in mind, as I've said repeatedly, we are fairly confident about the track, give or take about 300 kilometers, but due to the extreme nature of the load that the ECMWF is depicting, we should take that solution with a grain of salt and also be somewhat skeptical, as we should be. So let's look and see if we have any other agreement from the other forecast models, beginning with the latest 18Z run of the GFS. And at this point, it's fairly obvious that for at least the next 48 to 72 hours, we will continue to see heavy rainfall with the threat of flooding from Townsville, Charters Towers, southward down to Mackay, and even Brisbane, and especially more so Brisbane as we go into the extended period. And as we look at the GFS more into 72 hours, the differences between the European and GFS really begin to show up here. The GFS is still a tad more west, which makes all the difference. It keeps the center of circulation inland, which is going to allow the low to steadily weaken over time due to topography. And without a strong fetch over the Coral Sea, the winds right along the coastline are not going to be quite as strong. But you're still looking at a fairly strong system coming through based on this model run, so you definitely cannot take this system lightly. And as we go into 114 and 120 hours by day 5, the low is now offshore, so the GFS is also a little quicker. 
and if I had to take a guess as to which one would be more accurate, the GFS looks a little bit more reasonable, at least at this time. So what are we looking at in terms of precipitation over the next five to eight days based on that scenario? Well, I've had a couple people mention to me that Australia, first and foremost, really needs some of this rainfall because it's been so dry and so hot. But based on climatology, these are some of the values we can expect. We're looking at up to 25 to 50 millimeters over the next eight days right along the coastline. But regardless of how much you need the rainfall, you really don't need it all in one week. And this is the GFS total precipitation valid for the next six days. And you see a wide swath of the East Coast receiving in excess of 150 to 200 millimeters with near 400 to 500 millimeters being progged to develop just to the south of Rockhampton and Gladstone. Now don't get too carried away with this model depiction. The models will not be able to fully grasp the high resolution needed for the type of rainfall accuracy that you would ordinarily like, but it does give a very good idea as to what is possible. And even down toward the south near Brisbane, you're looking at at least an excess of 300 to 350 millimeters of rainfall. So there is going to be flooding, no doubt about that part. The only question is going to be which exact local communities are going to be impacted the most and how fast will the rain fall. That is going to make all the difference in terms of the flood potential. And finally, in terms of the Cyclone Oswald coverage for this video, you can see on the latest regional radar animation that the low-level circulation is still just to the south of Cairns with all of the heaviest action now south of the center of circulation. And all the areas between Townsville and Cairns have received over 100 millimeters within just the last 24 hours. We're already seeing that heavy rainfall spreading well to the south, including Mackay, Rockhampton, and even starting to work its way as far south as Brisbane. So the rainfall totals are going to be very similar as we go into 24 hours for locations down south. Again, well in excess of 100 millimeters, with those values climbing way higher if you account for the next three and four days. Elsewhere, we see the remnants of the Western Australia tropical cyclone continuing to push southward. And although we still see heavy rainfall and convection associated with the system, all of this activity is pushing south beyond the coastline, and it should fizzle out over the next day or so. As for the rest of the tropics, we are in the all clear at least for the next 48 to 72 hours. The only other highlighted area in the official products from the Joint Typhoon Warning Center Bureau of Meteorology or Fiji Meteorological Services comes from the JTWC update and that's for this very weak area of low pressure in the Mozambique Channel but it's being highly sheared and no development is expected. So that wraps up your tropical weather update from 28storms.com. Please continue to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and of course the website for more frequent updates. As you may know by now, 28storms.com is primarily a United States based weather information website but we do cover severe weather and especially tropical cyclones. When it comes to global tropical activity, there are no limits as to what we can track. We track everything from the West Pacific to the South Pacific on westward into the Indian Ocean, not to mention our nonstop coverage of Northern Hemisphere hurricanes. So if this level of content or information is your type of thing, then please be sure to follow us. And the only thing that we ask in return is for you to spread the word to others that may be interested. So that is all, and have a good day.